from the number one best-selling author of Life Rescripted. You're now tuning in to the Year of Purpose podcast. I'm Zephan Moses Blacksburg. Terry Lancaster is a speaker, lifelong entrepreneur, and the number one best-selling author of Better, Self-Help for the Rest of Us. He writes and speaks on the power of habit and focus, helping people build better lives, one better decision at a time, one minor adjustment at a time, one better focused action at a time. For the last 20 years, he's been producing the biggest, loudest car dealer commercials in the history of big, loud car dealer commercials, most of that time working from home in his underwear. Born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, he holds a degree in English and Journalism from Tennessee Technological University, where he learned how to program ginormous room-sized computers using a deck of cards and a rubber band, and how to edit newspaper and radio ads using a ruler, a razor blade, and scotch tape. And while all of that may make him sound MacGyver cool, it hasn't come in handy much since graduation. Along with his wife of 28 years, Terry is the proud parent of three daughters and spends most of his free time like every other middle-aged, overweight, native southerner at the ice rink playing hockey. Terry, thanks for being here today. Zeph, I'm glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and you know, I actually played hockey in college, so it's I always love being on the ice. It's a great place to be. There's there's nothing better in my life than I'm on, on the ice playing hi- hockey. That is my happy place. <laughs> so tell me about this biggest, loudest car dealer commercial thing. You know, I'm a videographer myself, so I've done a few commercials for TV stations yeah. locally and things like that, and I've been in the marketing world for a while. I'd love to hear, you know, what got you into this? How do you go from English and journalism in college to this and uh, and then bring us up to present time? Oh yeah, well you know, you know you're sitting at home, uh, you're you're watching TV late at night, and you know there's all the all the commercials, and there's the the uh, the Vegetti where they're making spaghetti out of out of vegetables, and you see all the uh, the the buy here pay here commercials, and then all of a sudden the com- car dealer commercial comes on, and it's louder and brighter and shinier, and it's just booming. Well, that that that's what I do. I do I do the ones that shake the windows. It's uh, it's buy, hurry in and buy a car now, and I kind of got into it. Um, I was I, I went to school to become an engineer. When I graduated from high school, uh, they told me that I needed to be an engineer because I, was, I did pretty decent at math. And I went to college to become an engineer and found out that even though I was decent at math, I wasn't very good at making stuff or fixing things. So I did not need to be an engineer. And I switched my major to journalism because that's where the college radio station was. And so I went to the college radio station. I was I was spinning REM discs and uh, and uh, you know Mexican radio by Wall of Voodoo and all the all the great 1980s alternative stuff. That's what I was doing on the radio. And I went to work in commercial radio. And I was spinning records there, and I found out that the disc jockeys weren't the one who made any money at radio stations. It was the salespeople who were really running the radio station. So when I graduated from college, I went into radio sales, selling advertising. And over the course of time, I found out that all of the money from the radio station, the biggest customer was always, always, always the car dealer. So I just eventually got really good at working with car dealers. I worked at a couple of radio stations in Mississippi and one of the largest, most powerful radio stations in the country, FM 100 in Memphis, Tennessee. I was their automotive specialist. And after a few years of doing that, I just cut out the radio stations completely and became an automotive. We, um, myself and my partner, business partner, we started an automotive advertising agency. And we work with dealers from, from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan to Miami, Florida. And we specialized in event-oriented, action-oriented, hurry in, come by a car right now, big old loud, obnoxious car dealer commercials. Everybody hates them except the 1% of the market who's in the market to buy a car right now. And if you're looking for a car... When my commercials come on, you'll you'll, you'll pay attention. <laughs> so it's quite interesting from a marketing standpoint because typically people have you know a much different uh, or or at least a wider market. You know, if uh, a commercial comes on for me and it's uh, you know come on into Red Lobster, well yeah, I'm hungry. I'm sitting here and it's almost dinner time. Of course, I want to come in for dinner. But with a car, it's different. You don't exactly buy them you know every day or every other week or even every other year. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The only one percent of the market is looking for a car right now and it's a at best it's an every two or three year decision so you have to uh, the dealers have to uh, they have to advertise all the time because that one percent changes every week every weekend a different group of people is looking for a car and you have to 
you have to get the right now buyers in, but you also have to implant a message so that the, the other 99% of the population knows who you are. Like I tell dealers, if uh, you're not, and the way the market's going now, if you're not on the shopping list, by the time they start making a shopping list, you're not going to be on the list. So you, our, our commercials really have to pull double duty. They have to create the right now action but they also have to uh, and create an image and put that subliminal bug in people's minds. So six months, six years from now, whenever it is they're thinking about buying a car, they that your name is on the top of their list. So in a second, I want to jump into if it's possible for the way you make commercials and, and get that 1% attention, uh, if it's possible to relate that to just our life and how we're creating our own businesses or even our own uh, you know personality that we're putting off to the world. But I wanted to real quick jump into, you know, you started in engineering and then went to school for English and journalism and now, you know, wound up making these commercials. I think it's really cool to find people where they're not doing that one thing that they originally set out for, because I think in life, uh, some of us can get stuck in this way of thinking, oh, well, you know, this is what I went to school for. This is what I have to stay doing the rest of my life. Maybe right. you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I've, I've got actually I've got daughters in college now. I've got two daughters, daughters that are juniors in college, and I've got another daughter who is a junior in high school. And what I've what I've told them is, oh, and 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 I, I feel bad for them because the stress is enormous on young people these days. Oh, you know, everything's a challenge, and I have to I have to pick the right school, and I have to pick the right major, and I've got to get everything right right because the rest of my life depends on it. And what I've tried to tell my children is no. The rest of your life doesn't depend on it. You need to do the best you can do today. You need to go to school. You need to pick a major. And, you know, if you can pick a major that will help you make a little money for your first two or three years out of college, that's great. But the main thing you need to do is you need to get into school. You need to develop the habits that are going to help you learn because you're going to be learning lifelong. It's, it's very easy to come out of college and people think, well, that's it. I've, I've, I'm out of college. I've got it made. And this is why, you know, now I'm now I'm an engineer. I've got my degree, but life moves pretty quick. And the world I graduated from college in 30 years ago doesn't exist anymore. And every day is a new day. So you have to be prepared to, to wake up every day and face the new challenges that the world's going to bring you. Because what happened when you were in class last year is probably not going to be relevant. So don't sweat the details too much. Get into college, get out, get your degree, get moving, but learn everything you can today so you can be ready to learn what you can tomorrow. And it sounds like you were really able to evolve with this. I mean, you were talking about how you, you noticed that the people who were in sales were the ones that were making money. And then when That's you right. got the opportunity, you know, you realized at that moment, okay, it's time to, to make this pivot in my life. And so I think that that's probably one of the big things that's gotten you to where you are now. But uh, jumping into that whole car commercial thing, you know, if there's any entrepreneurs or even want to be entrepreneurs that are listening in right now, you know, you are in quite an interesting and unique market where you are talking to a very, very small group of people. And when you do, you have to make sure that you get through the noise. Like you said, these are the commercials that are the loud, booming ones that, you know, make the, the whole room flicker at night with the light on the screen. That's um, right. You know, so how are you, you know, what are some of the secrets or pieces of the formula to attract people in and really get their attention in such a noisy environment? Well, uh, the first thing is is it's the same thing they teach you in sales 101, attention, interest, desire, and action. The first thing you have to do is grab their attention, and that's why we do the big loud commercials, because different gets noticed, and everyone, you know, you, there's the stereotype of car dealers as being big and loud, but actually most of them aren't. Most car dealer commercials are are plain and boring. It's the it's the owner standing there talking about how his grandfather started the dealership a hundred years ago, or they 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 try to make some joke, or they're showing some cars and the production value is not very great. So a big loud spot with lots of movement, lots of energy, lots. Of, you, I know you've got some videography experience, so we do fast cuts, we do bright lights, we 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 everything everything jumps because it's a subliminal thing. The first thing, one of the first things I learned in radio is that to uh, for a radio spot um, to to produce it with two different music beds. So you go 15 seconds into the spot and then you change the music beds because underneath it, you may not even notice that that music bed changes, but that just that subtle change of switching music from one piece to another makes your mind go, hey, something different is happening here. 
and different gets noticed. So every time something changes, your mind has to tune back in to see if it's something interesting going on. And if it's not interesting, your mind will tune out in two or two or three seconds and, and, and move on. So you have to give, give, give your mind, you have to dangle carrots up there so that the brain is constantly jumping in. Oh, am I going to miss anything if I'm not paying attention? Oh, what was that? Oh, something's different. So you want to be as different as possible. And that applies in life as well. You, you, you want to stand out from the crowd. You don't want to look like everyone else. You don't want to sound like everyone else. You don't want to say the same thing as everything else, as everyone else. So you have different gets noticed, whether it's on a commercial or uh, on your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, I think that's a big one there is different gets noticed. And, um, you know, speaking of being different and, and being unique, you know, something that has happened recently for you is, you know, you published a book, it's called Better Self-Help for the Rest of Us. Uh, tell me, you know, how did this idea come about? Like, where did it come from for you? Well, it, uh, I, uh, even though I was a journalism major, I never really planned on writing a book. I've been writing commercials for 30 years, and I haven't written much more than 90 words in a row. But a couple of years ago, three, four years ago to be exact, my, my older children were about to graduate from high school. I had settled into a rut. Uh, the economy at that time was was not super spectacular, so so times were hurt hard, and I was I was drinking too much, and I wasn't exercising enough, and I was eating the wrong foods, and I wasn't taking care of myself, and I was kind of going on autopilot. And um, had a couple of things happen, and I just woke up one morning and said, "This doesn't, this doesn't work anymore. I'm going to start start making some changes." So I started exercising and a little bit at a time, and then I started exercising every day. Today will be my 450th day in a row that I've got up and ran at wow. least one mile. So, um, so I started doing some some minor changes. Lost about 60 pounds, and I quit drinking. And along the way, since I since I was a writer. I, I started writing about it and just just writing a little blog post. I looked the other day. My first blog post was December twentieth, two thousand twelve, and I, I didn't even know where I was going with this. I was just going to write about the changes that I was trying to make in my life and mainly for myself. Dear diary, I got up and ran, you know, half a mile today, and and I ate two bananas for breakfast, and you know, just just that sort of thing. And I started started working on this, and I, I wrote I wrote for a year before I really decided that. Maybe I maybe this is something I I, I can do. I, I put the 500 word blog post together and I wrote several of them. After about a year, I looked at this and I said, well, if I if I if I organize them this way and I start start thinking about it this way, maybe I can turn this into a book. And uh, the book was completely completely accidental. The first, I had a, had a buddy even when, even before I started writing when I first started blogging and I was making the changes in my life. He says, Terry, you should write a book about what you're doing. And I, I laughed at him. I said, that, that's funny, right? I'm, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to call it How to Lose 100 Pounds and Make a Million Dollars. And uh, you, Because you go on Amazon, and there's a 1,000 books on Amazon that's some variation of How to Lose 100 Pounds and, ma and Make a Million Dollars because – that's that's the stick. That's the carrot that they use to motivate you to get up here and, and, and do the things. They they show you this idea of perfection. Well, what's different, because different gets noticed, what's different in my, about my book is I complete, completely take a different approach. Instead of concentrating on the carrot, which is the million dollars and the hundred pounds you're going to lose and the six-pack abs and the new business you're going to create, I start exactly where you are. And I tell people you can't get where you're going unless you start where you are. So that's the point of being better is starting where you are and getting a little bit better every day, concentrating on the actions that you take daily instead of the outcomes, which are going to take care of themselves as long as you're doing what you need to be doing. So I think one of the big things that stood out for me, though, is hearing you've, you've been running 450 days nonstop in a row. That's right. Without breaking that chain. That's right. So where does someone... Uh, create a skill like that you know like I you know I've gotten into great routines of going to the gym three four days a week and then you know you get sick and you're out for a week or something you know how do you make sure that you keep that up and because um, I mean clearly you you haven't been down and out at any point in time if you've kept it up for that for that long you know 450 well, days that's quite some time it is, uh, you know, and actually, I was sick in December with the stress of, uh, you know, you just released a book, so you know the, this situation. I released my book in December. It was immensely stressful. I was, I was, I was working twelve, fourteen, fifteen hours a day trying to get everything done and get in there. Then it's December. You got Christmas coming up, and I got sick. I had, a, I had a sinus infection that developed into bronchitis. It started out with a little, little cold. So I was sick for about six weeks in the, cor in the course of the, from, from December to mid-January. Uh, but I still ran 
a mile every day. And the whole the whole everyday thing is uh, I call it don't break the streak. I, I picked that up from uh, from Jerry Seinfeld, and Jerry Seinfeld's a prolific comedian. He's all he's always been writing, but when he was a stand up comic, he was still you know prolific and wrote and wrote new jokes every day. And he had a young comedian ask him one day, well you know. Some days I just don't I don't feel like it. I, I I don't feel funny. You know, the the muse isn't there. There's nothing happening. And, and Jerry said, look, man, this this is a job. You've got to write every day whether you feel like it or not. And so what I do this. So this is the Jerry Seinfeld technique is you take a big giant year at a glance calendar and take a red Sharpie, and put it on your desk. And every day he wrote a He wrote a, a joke. He would put an X on that day. And uh, so he wrote a, a joke one day, he put an X down. He did it the second day, he put another X down. And he got a, got a little streak going. He got a chain. And eventually, when, once that's going, your brain gets used to it, and you'll do whatever you can to not break the streak. And that's exactly what I do. I run every day, and I run in the rain, I run in the snow, I run in the ice, I run on days when I'm sick, I run on days when I'm super busy, and I don't get around to doing it till 10 o'clock at night. But I'm going to do, if it's at all possible... I'm going to get up and I'm going to run at least a mile, usually almost two miles. I run about 1.7 miles a day. It's my normal normal route. I'm going to run at least a mile just so I can check it off so I can keep saying I've ran so many days in a row. I don't want to break, break the streak. So that's that's the main thing. I, and actually, I've got a 10-day a build a streak worksheet that I, that I give to people to help them get started on not breaking the chain. And one of the first rules Actually, the first step for, toward building one of these streaks and getting it going is to start small. We uh, we we want to start running the marathon, and, or or doing a hundred push-ups and a hundred sit-ups a day. And we we always start big because you know we got big intentions and big plans. But big intentions or big plans are just like the books that are telling you to lose lose a hundred pounds and make a million dollars. That it's, you're setting up this big goal and you're setting yourself up for frustration and failure. So what I do is tell people to start small. You know, run around the block every day. Do one push-up a day. Start so small that you almost can't not do it, that it's impossible to fail. And then the more you succeed, the more that breeds confidence, the more that keeps you going. But if you're shooting for this impossible, unobtainable goal, you, you, might, you might get motivated for it the first two or three days, but motivation is a depletable asset. And the more you use it, the less you have, and the harder something is to do, the more motivation it takes. So motivation is always going to fail you at the exact moment you need it most. You can't count on motivation to get big deals done. So start small and do it every day until you've got a streak going, you got the confidence going, and go from there. And I think it's great to see that sort of chain. You know, once you get going, it's like, well, you know, you can't fail yourself now. Yeah. You're already so far into it. You know, there's no reason to, to stop here. Um, I think that it's definitely a huge motivator. And as that chain grows even longer and you see, you know, I've been doing this for months now, then you're really going to feel bad if you break the chain for one day. So I, yeah. I think that's an excellent way to to not only form habits, but really keep them going. And, um, you know, along the lines of, of habit formation, you know, something you had mentioned to me before we jumped on this call is something uh, quite interesting that I think you've experienced. I've never personally experienced, but you told me about naked yoga. So <laughs> how Every has that come into your life? <laughs> well, everyone gets a big kick out of it when I start talking about naked yoga. And I'm going to tell you, the, the two things you need to know about naked yoga is number one I'm not naked and number two it's not yoga but the uh, but but ju scantily clad jumping around and stretching just didn't quite have the same ring to it I am uh, <laughs> I 15 years ago, actually 17 years ago when my youngest daughter right after my youngest daughter was born I was diagnosed with malignant melanoma I had a tumor on my stomach stage 2 melanoma cancer and melanoma is one of the scariest words in the world um, metastatic melanoma is ridiculously scary. So I spent five, ten years just scared to death that I was about to die, and I had three young children under the age of five. And the doctor told me, you got to stay out of the sun. So I did. I stayed out of the sun, inside, and uh, there's some, what there's, you've heard of SAD, seasonal affective disorder, where, you, where if you don't get enough sunlight, you, it, it affects your personality, it, it's depressing, it, uh, it drives you into a funk. Well, I spent about 15 years in a funk because I didn't get outside and get enough sunshine. And when I started making some of these changes in my life a few years ago and exercising more, uh, I, I won't run on a treadmill. That doesn't count. I've got to get outside in the sun if it's sunny, in the rain if it's rainy, but I want to be outside. 
And what I found is the sunshine is 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 some of the best medicine in the world. So I want to make a point if there's sunshine to get out every day. And I started getting out in the sun on my deck, going outside every day and uh, and just stretching. I, I, I'd taken some yoga classes and uh, but uh, again, yoga classes, you go in there with all these beautiful women and they've all got their 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 fancy cups and their fancy leotards and and they can pull their you know the head behind their shoulders and, and do all this. It's just that wasn't me. So I just started in in my backyard, out out on the deck in the sunshine. I would stretch. I would lean over and touch my toes, and and started doing some of the balance techniques that I would learn, and I'd do the mountain pose. And uh, if you ever watched the, the TED, a great TEDx video uh, by a, a psychologist by the name of Amy Cuddy, who tells you uh, just the the fact of standing in a powerful pose, standing in a powerful position with your arms raised to the air, can affect your mood. And you do that outside in the sunshine, it affects your mood any even more. So I combined that with uh, doing doing some high knees and some jumping jacks and a little calisthenics so I could get my heart rate up. And I started doing this outside in the sunshine. And so it's, when it's warm, in, I live in Nashville. When it's warm in Nashville, it's up around 75 degrees. I'll go outside in, in, in my little short shorts and I'll jump around on my deck for a little while and I'll stretch for a little while and I'll stand in the sunshine for a little while and I'll clean my pool. And if I can spend 30 minutes outside breaking a sweat, stretching and meditating in the sunshine, it sets my whole day on the path of righteousness. There is there's almost the only thing better would be playing ice hockey. So if I could play ice hockey in the sunshine, that would combine everything. (laughs) (laughs) So it sounds like you really do have a solid routine down, not only for, you know, starting your day, taking care of yourself, uh, you know, just moving yourself forward in general uh, in life. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more of that. In the book, there's something, too, that you mentioned, um, you know, is Kaizen or the practice of continuous improvement. Um, Maybe share a little bit more about, you know, how anyone tuning in right now can, you know, constantly stay in this state of, uh, you know, moving forwards and improving themselves. You know, one thing is that uh, chain of red X's on the calendar. Uh, You know, another thing is, you know, creating a, a sort of routine for themselves. You know, is there another way that we can constantly be making sure that we're bettering ourselves? Well, I think I think the whole point is is being present, being mindful of where you are. One of the things that affected me most is being grateful, St- taking a step back and looking at where I'm at in my life and realizing, man, I've got it pretty good. I, you know, I'm, I may not have the fanciest car in the world. I may not have the fanciest house in the world. But you go back 100, 200 years, any king in the world would have gladly traded all his possessions for, for my 10-year-old car, for, for, for my you know, four-bedroom ranch house. The, you know, we, where, where we live, we take all these amazing blessings that we have for granted. I've got, I've got a device right here in my hand that has the sum total of all human knowledge from, from 40,000 years. Everything any human being has ever learned, I can find out right here on, on my phone. So we live in amazing times. So the first step is taking a look at where you are being mindful of the of the blessings that you have and then being a steward of them we get so concentrated so focused on what we don't have and we go on facebook and everyone's everyone's got amazing vacations and they've got new jobs and they've got they got the beautiful spouses and their kids are better looking than our kids and their kids make the uh, the triple a travel team and our kids only made the double a travel hockey team and we compare our lives to everyone else instead of accepting what we have and then improving it. We mean we have, not only do we have the the resources to make our life better, we have the right to make our lives better, but we have the responsibility to make our lives better for ourselves, for our family, for the ones around us, and for our loved ones. We have that responsibility, and the only way you can do that is a little bit at a time. Again, if you start, if you focus on these huge goals, you're just going to get distracted. When you don't, when you wake, you know, I want to lose 50 pounds, and when, you know, when you don't lose 50 pounds in the first month, you're just going to be, well, that didn't work again. And you're going to go back to the couch and you're going to sit there and you're going to watch another episode of NCIS and eat a whole, you know, whole jar of haagen ice cream. But instead of focusing on losing the 50 pounds, focus on the daily activities, one step at a time, one little bit of exercise, one, one cup of broccoli instead of one pint of haagen just doing the little things because it's the little things that are always going to add up to the big things. Yeah, most certainly. I think that, uh, you know, I've mentioned this 
a ton of times before, but um, I think focusing on just one thing and just getting started there is the most important thing you could do. It's so easy to get distracted and go off in all sorts of tangents and directions, and then you realize that uh, you're really no further than where you were when you got started because you just got pulled in way too many uh, directions. So I think that you're absolutely right there is, you know, picking something small and just working at it and, and keep going. Um, Terry, it's been a great conversation here. I've, I've loved having you on. Uh, any sort of last, uh, you know, I know you're, you have a history of being MacGyver cool. So is there any sort of last MacGyver style tips or advice just for anyone looking to better themselves? Uh, and, you know, any little tidbits from the book that you might want to mention? Well, uh, we're, we're talking about you know pushing. We we all want to push in all directions, and we all, we all want to plan, and we want to list. We want to read every book, and I, I I want people to read my book. I want people to read your book. But uh, but remember, you're not going to learn everything you need to learn from a book, and the only way to do it is to do it. So whatever the changes is, you the changes are that you want to make in your life, just do it. Just get started, and, and you're going to stumble, and you're going to fall, and things aren't going to work out like you planned. They, they never do, but you know, get started, get going, giddy up. That's all, that's that's my only advice for just about anything. Get going. <laughs> I think that's perfect. And Terry, thanks so much for being here today and spending some time with us. What's the best place for everyone to find out more about you, about what you do, and uh, to find your book? Well, uh, you can find me at terrylancaster.com. You go on terrylancaster.com. It's going to have all my social media connections. I'm active on on Facebook. I'm active on LinkedIn. I'm active on Twitter. So I'd love for everyone to connect with me there. And there's also connection the uh, links where you can buy the book on Amazon. It's available now in paperback and hardback and uh, in, in Kindle you know, electronic versions. So you can buy the book on Amazon, but the links are all right there on my website, terrylancaster.com. Uh, connect with me and uh, let me know how you're doing on your streaks. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, Terry, and we'll definitely be in touch. Thanks, Zeph. Hey, everyone, it's Zeph. Did you like this episode? Be sure to subscribe so that you can tune in next week and tell a friend about the show. If you want access to free training and exclusive interviews on success, happiness, lifestyle design, and adventure, visit me at yearofpurpose.com. Until next time, Go out and let life surprise you so that you can live a life rescripted. scripted